Hey everyone, this is the lecture for chapter 8, the musculoskeletal system. And if you could draw your attention to two things, one would be your CPT book, starting on page 131. The other would be your ICD-10-CM book, starting on page 781. Um, as we have done in the previous week or as we've started the surgery section, um, we're going to go through the presentation where it is going to um, have a review of medical terminology and anatomy, as well as ICD-10-CM and um, common abbreviations, eponyms, and acronyms that are um, going to be linked specifically to the musculoskeletal system. So here's where it starts to get a little bit more fine-tuned um, as we move into the move into the course and um, through the different organ systems. So first, I want to start with the anatomy of the musculoskeletal system, um, which its function, so its physiology, its function is to provide the framework of our body. There's 206 bones, joints, and cartilage providing protection and support to our organs. There is a considerable variation in bone structure among both the races and the sexes, as we probably have seen or heard throughout the years. So, you know, people of one race will have a specific bone structure, bone, bone weight, bone um, mass and layout. And then um, also, you know, females will have a, a lighter structure than men may in their bone structure. So um, the sex of a skeleton can be determined um, by the bone structure of the pelvis which of course, females, we have an open cavity, cavity where um, our reproductive organs would be. So um, the two main parts of the skeleton are the axial and the appendicular. The axial is comprised of the bones of the head, which is your skull or cranium. Another word for that is cranium. Um, your neck, which is referred to as the cervical spine or cervical vertebrae. And then the trunk. So the trunk is going to include ribs, sternum, vertebrae, and the sacrum, uh, which is our um, hip area. The appendicular skeleton consists of the bones of the limbs, including those forming the pectoral shoulder and pelvic girdles. All bones are covered on the outside by a thin layer of periosteum. Periosteum. A cavity in a bone is called an antrum or an air cell, so like an air pocket um, cavity inside of the bone. And it is also called a sinus in some cases. So when we start talking about the bones of the face and our sinus cavities, um, that is what that's referenced to. It's called an antrum or a sinus. A hole through a bone is called a foramen. So those are some terminology, common terms that you should be familiar with. Um, and if you recall, going back to your ICD-10-CM book in the tabular list, this is that area where you're going to come here in, in that book, page 781, specifically for the musculoskeletal skeletal system, which aligns with your ICD-10 CM guideline chapters. So all things chapter 13 guidelines would be related to the musculoskeletal system and connective tissue. And these are the codes that are going to range from M00 to M99. Bone tissue is living tissue. Um, it is metabolically active, serving critical functions, and it is a hard form of connective tissue. Bones have a bloody supply, venous drainage, and a sensory nerve supply. It also contains calcium and phosphorus, so those are two very important nutrients that our body needs. Functions of the bone include protection for vital organs, support for the body and its vital cavities, mechanical basis for movement, storage of minerals like calcium and phosphorus, and production and storage of new blood cells. So we'll we'll dig deeper into this when we start talking about the um, uh, hematology and, and somewhat of the lymphatics um, where we talk more about the production of blood, but blood production 
actually begins in the bones, um, which is why cancers like leukemia, cancers of the blood, often require bone marrow transplants because that's where blood, blood is um, born or produced. There's two types of bones, compact and spongy. And whenever two bones come together, whether movement is allowed or not allowed, that's what we call a joint. Um, so we have the, the obvious movable joints like our hip, our um, arms, our legs. Joints are subject not only to structural injuries and dislocations, but also to inflammatory conditions like arthritis of various kinds. Sutures in the skull are very uh, are a type of joint as well. So those little lines that you see um, on the skull, um, they are a joint as well because in babies we we know that their brain, um, not their brain, but the skull hasn't fully fused together yet. And when it does, where two bones attach or connect, that is called a joint. It, so that joint is not a movable joint. Once it joins together, it doesn't move anymore. This type of joint is found only in the skull, again, are immovable. The muscular system consists of muscles acting to move and position parts of the body. Most muscles are attached directly or indirectly through tendons to bones, cartilage, ligaments, or fascia, which is muscle tissue, um, or some combination of these structures. So this is how um, bones are connected together. This is what we refer to as connective tissue, the ligaments, tendons, and cartilage. So again, all of this information um, in regards to the anatomy, the terminology is going to be available in uh, your ICD-10-CM tabular list. So this is one area that I love to stress because the importance of you being able to utilize this book as your reference during the exam is going to save you from um, stress and spending a lot of time trying to think about things when you can literally just turn to the page of that organ system to find the information that you need and that you're looking for. Um, and it's going to really be important for you to, to use that um, because, you know, 206 bones, um, several organ tissues or connective tissues um, is going to be very helpful for you to not try to memorize those and to just use the reference that's in front of you. Know where to go in your book. That's the whole key to this exam is knowing where in your CPT book to find your answers or in either, either of your books. So let's talk about muscles. There's three types of muscles. You have your skeletal muscle, which is also referred to your striated as, as striated. You have smooth muscle and then your cardiac muscle. So skeletal muscles move bones and other structures. Smooth muscles form part of the walls of most vessels and hollow organs, like your intestines, like your uh, uh, blood vessels, like your um, veins, all smooth muscle. Those muscles are also um, what we call involuntary or auton autonomic because they they contract and they move on your own on their own. We don't have to physically think about moving our blood vessels. They're going to automatically expand and contract based off of the pressure that is flowing, a pressure of our blood that's flowing within them. Um, whereas your striated muscles, the ones that are connected to bones, I have to tell. My brain has to tell my arm to move, my leg to move. Um, the last muscle is our cardiac muscle. This forms most of the walls of the heart and adjacent parts of the great vessels, such as the aorta, the pulmonary vein, and the superior vena cava, because those are extremely larger in comparison to your smooth muscle veins. Um, Cardiac muscle contractions are not under voluntary control. It is regulated by a pacemaker, uh, which is composed of special cardiac muscle fibers. So this is your natural internal pacemaker. And when that does not work any longer, that is when someone may have to have one 
um, a device implanted to act as a pacemaker. So your cardiac muscle is both striated and involuntary um, because it serves dual purposes. Something has to hold it in place. So you're striated, um, you know, it's striated in that sense as it's attached to other things. Um, and then involuntary because, again, our heart just, it beats. We don't have to tell it to beat. Just like we don't have to tell our eyes to blink. It just does. Um, the axilla or armpit area is a dome-shaped area between the arm and the lateral chest wall and the shape and size of the axilla, axilla varies depending on the position of the arm. The axilla provides a passageway for vessels and nerves going to and from the upper limb and it has an apex based, based um, four walls, three of which are composed of muscles. So it, it actually takes a lot of muscle to move your arms. If you've ever had any type of surgery, you know, in your breast area, um, you'll you'll understand that all of those, or even in your chest area where muscle was involved, um, you'll understand that it's very, very hard to regain the function and use of your arms properly until those muscles have um, healed from the stress of a surgical procedure or an injury for that matter. Um, when the arm is ab abducted or moved away from the body, like if you stretch your arm out, um, the boundaries of the axilla can be seen. Anteriorly is the pectoralis major muscle. So that would be the one kind of um, on the, the front, anterior is the front. Um, the latimus, the latissimus dorsi muscle is the posterior muscle and the serratus muscle anterior medially and the humerus laterally so all of these muscles will affect you know in your armpit area are going to affect your shoulder is going to affect your use of your arm um if you've ever had physical therapy or known someone that has had to have physical therapy on their shoulder they really do a lot of manipulation work with the uh pectoralis major muscle because hence the name major um, it, it plays a huge role. It is very strong um, and it, it needs to be strengthened in order for the other muscles around it to react properly. Um, the axilla is a passageway, again, for vessels and nerves going to and from the upper limb. Part of the brachial plexus passes through the axilla. The bra brachial plexus is made up of spinal nerves. So again, all of this kind of works together, which is why if someone has a back injury, it's going to affect the way they walk. It's going to affect the use of their arms um, because of the nerves that run through the muscles that run through that area. Um, the brachial plexus is a major network of nerves supplying the upper limb. Also, um, in addition, and and so if you're following along in your ICD-10CM book with the anatomy portion of this presentation, then you can take a look at, for example, um, page 782, um, number six in that outline, where it talks about the bones of the upper extremity. So familiarize yourself with the layout of this. So you will kind of have a, and, and use your highlighters if you need to. Because number six is the bones of the upper extremity. Number seven is bones of the lower. Number eight is the articulations or joints. And, you know, it really gives great breakdowns of each bone. Um, and that's why this section is so large. So lymph nodes, also in our armpits, we know that we have lymph nodes um, located there because we learned about that in the previous system, the integumentary. So just kind of think about it as our body, everything runs together, right? So every part that we learn, every organ system that we learn is just building on the information we previously learned. Um, many lymph nodes are located in the axilla and these lymph nodes receive lymph drainage from various parts of the body, including the thoracic wall and most of the breast, as well as from the upper limb. So you can get, you know, lumps under your armpits because your lymph nodes are working and draining things, um, you know, infection or fluid from other parts of your body. 
With an infected laceration to the lower arm, lymph nodes may be felt as small nodules in the axilla. Um, fractures have been given specific names. So because we're talking about the musculoskeletal system, there's a lot of um, reference and procedures that are going to be directed at repairing or um, um, mobilizing, immobilizing, sorry, because you don't want it to move, or um, manipulating fractures, meaning putting the bone, manually putting the bone back where it, it should be um, to promote healing. So fractures have been given specific names, including um, this list here. So starting with the Coley's fracture, this is a fracture of the distal radius with displacement and or angulation of the distal bone. And again, this is something that you will also find in the tabular list for chapter 13. So if you look at some of this you may find um, like starting on page 787 where it talks about common pathology and also some of it you are likely to find in the tabular list next to the diagnosis code that is going to reference each particular type of those fractures. Um, so that's the Coley's. The Smith's fracture is a reverse Coley. So it's a fracture of the distal radius, which is part of the arm, with displacement of the fragment toward the palmar aspect. So remember, you have your, um, in your lower arm, you have your radius bone and your ulna bone. So it depends on which way the bone is turned or bent or broken or if it's, you know, punctured through the skin and it's open. Um, those are going to be the variations in the names of these fractures. The Jones fracture is a transverse stress fracture of the proximal shaft of the fifth metatarsal. That's the toe. The Salter-Harris fracture is a fracture that involves the epiphyseal or growth plate of a bone commonly occurs in children and is divided into nine different types. So it occurs in 15% of children's long bone fractures. So your long bones would be your femur and your leg and then the, um, oh, the humerus in your arm. Um, The Dupuytren's fracture is a fracture of the part of the fibula, that's the leg, lower leg, uh, with dislocation of the ankle. ankle. So that, that fracture would run down um, the, out, the exterior side um, of your ankle, the, of your leg down to your ankle. The Montagia's fracture is a fracture of the proximal ul ulna going back up to the arm with dislocation of the head of the radius. So um, my suggestion would be to maybe Google some of these fractures so that you can see pictures of them and what they look like. But there is also an image in the tabular list. Um, I do know that for certain. Amazingly, broken bones heal. So if a bone is broken, it is going to typically heal. Um, but the healing process can... Um, reshape the bone. It can take longer in some bones than others. It may require fixation. Um, internal fixation would be like rods, screws, or any type of um, metal that would be attached to the bone. External fixation would be um, um, holding something holding together um, holding together of a broken bone by means of plaster or fiberglass, like a cast, um, cast encircling the injured part during the healing process. So internal fixation is going to, again, use pins, screws, wires, could be plates. So that's your anatomy review. Remember, tabular list, ICD-10-CM book. Chapter 13, page 781 for the musculoskeletal system. Now, the 
Um, ICD 10 CM um, refresher is going to um, first go over where you can find codes for the musculoskeletal system. So, of course, chapter 13, that's diseases of the musculoskeletal system. Chapter 18, which would be signs, symptoms, um, and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings. So, signs or symptoms could be arm pain, leg pain, hip pain, back pain, uh, stomach pain. I'm sorry, that's not musculoskeletal, but, um, you know, all of those would be examples of symptoms that may be an indication that you have a fracture, a sprain, a dislocation. And then chapter 19 are your injury, poisoning, and other um, consequences of external causes. So you'll use those codes anytime. Um, basically, you have an injury code, which typically is going to be your fractures, your dislocations. Uh, most of these codes are found in these chapters that also will have site and laterality designations built into the code, meaning um, because we have, you know, two arms, two legs, two hands, two elbows, 10 fingers, 10 toes, um, the diagnosis code will likely identify the locations, the exact location of what area of the body is injured or being treated. So like here we have the diagnosis code M10.021, which is idiopathic gout of the right elbow. So it was specified that it was of right. This next code, M10.022, is gout of the left, left elbow. And then M10.029 is gout unspecified elbow. So that means you only use unspecified if it mentions no place else, whether it was right or left. Um, that way we're still able to code something. But if it's documented or mentioned in your question that it is right or left, then you would use one of those codes. Arthro, um, arth arthropathies, um, which are conditions of the bone. So, of course, you have a few things that you may be familiar with. You have um, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune inflammatory connective tissue disease that affects multiple body systems, um, but we're more likely to see manifestations of it in our joints, skin, um, cardiopulmonary system, the spleen, the renal system, um, the GI system, and it is more common in women than in men. Um, so an arthropathy is an abnormality of the joint or um, bone. Could be arth arthritis, um, special type of arthritis, because the word root for bone is arthro or for joint is arthro. Um, internal derangements of the knee. So these are a couple of abbreviations um, that you should be familiar with. The MCL is medial. Um, colorectal ligament and the ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament. So if you are in your CPT book, I'm not sure if I showed you this last time. In your CPT book, if you turn to the back inside cover, there's over 100 uh, frequently used or common abbreviations. And you may see those two in there. Um, and you may not, but other places that you would see them would be in the index of the CPT book. So if you ever come across an abbreviation and you're stuck and don't know what it is, index of the CPT book would be a good starting point. Or the common abbreviations page would be a good starting point. Um, a bucket handle tear is a tear of the lateral meniscus of the knee. So it is um, specific to the knee and um, likely will require surgery or some type of medical treatment. Um, dorsopathies. So dorsopathies is a disorder affecting the spinal column. So any condition of the spine, which is bone, right? So you have um, displacement of, um, I'm sorry, the fourth character of your diagnosis code is gonna identify the type of disorder 
The fifth character is going to identify the area of the spine. And then some of the diseases that you could see would be um, spondylosis, um, displacement, which is another term for dislocation of the vertebral disc, um, degenerative disc disease, spinal stenosis, which is um, stenosis, narrowing of the space in between um, your spinal canal. And those um, symptoms obviously would be pain, you know, in your back. Um, in thesopathy, sorry, are diseases occurring at the site of insertion of muscle tissues and ligaments. For example, you know, um, I had hip surgery this year in January and my surgery was targeted at uh, a labral tear. So the labrum is a connective tissue that helps to hold your hip joint in place. So it's located at the insertion point um, of where the hip is because that's where it needs to hold your, my hip, you know, your hip joint into the socket, um, basically. So your leg didn't fall off, <laughs> um, which it won't because you got other connective tissues, right? And we have skin, so it just can't fall off. But anyway, um, some common enthesopathies or conditions of the um, insertion point where muscles and tendons go are connected to the bone would be bursitis, so synovitis, tenosynovitis or tendonitis, um, and capsulitis. So very, very painful. Um, compartment syndrome, because where the, the bone and the connective tissue meet is where that bone is going into that compartment. Like think about your hip joint, your leg, your femur, is actually fitting in. Like when you take the legs off of a doll baby, same same thing. Bunions, we know what those are. Um, actually, they are um, swelling caused by inflammation of the bursa, which results in fibrosis or hardening of that bone and deformity. So um, what happens is, it's called hallus vagus. Um, that's another term for it. H-A-L-L-U-X-V-A-L-G-U-S, and it is a deviation of the tip of the great toe, meaning that it is no longer positioned as it should be. Um, here's some other conditions. So osteopathies would be of the joint, um, osteoporosis, osteomyelitis, osteochondrosis, so in curvature of the spine, scoliosis. Continue. Um, injury poisoning and certain other consequences of external causes. So anytime you have a sprain, strain, dislocation, um, nurse mates, elbow, elbow um, fractures, which are, these are different types. Um, you can have a closed fracture, meaning no bone is exposed through the skin, or an open fracture, meaning that it, it came through the skin and the bone is now exposed. And as you can see, there's several different types of closed fractures, several different types of op open fractures. Um, main thing to know here, you'll see it in your ICD-10 CM coding guidelines, is that if there if the fracture is not identified as open or closed, the default is going to be closed. And I'll show you that guideline in Chapter 13 guidelines. Um, Gastillo classification refers to uh, fracture designations based on helping us determine which seventh character to use in our diagnosis code. So like a type one wound would be one that is less than one centimeter. Um, type two would be um, one that is less than one centimeter, but moderately contaminated. Like say there's, you know, glass, I don't know, trash or whatever else could be in there, um, metal maybe. And so the higher the grade, the, the worse um, that fracture could possibly be classified. Injury and poisoning um, also are going to be big factors of how you report your external cause code. So that may be probably one of, I, I hate to say a challenge, but, you know, really getting to understand that part of diagnosis coding is going to come more with this, this chapter than probably any of the others.
So um, I encourage you to research these conditions just so you can understand what you're being asked to code and that would go for anything, you know, during this course of this class. If there's a condition or a procedure you're not familiar with, you YouTube for procedures or Google will be very, very helpful. Um, external cause codes are going to identify how the injury or health condition happened, um, the intent, the place of occurrence, the activity the patient was doing at the time, and the person's status as far as whether or not they are um, a civilian, a student. So those, this is going to be required anytime, like I said, you report a um, code from the S or T category. So a fracture, dislocation, um, drug overdose, you know, for example. Um, really, really use, you know, page 131 in your CPT book. Really use your table of contents, your anatomic illustrations. Um, they're going to be useful for helping you code from subsections. Having a good knowledge of anatomy and terminology is going to be really, really helpful as well. So let's take a look at the CPT book. In your CPT book, the musculoskeletal system, well, the table of contents starts on page 131. So as you can see, first they have in your CPT book, first they have an illustration of a skeleton. Obviously, that's not all 206 bones, but it's very, very helpful. Um, and you have other illustrations in the front of this book, in your Higgs Fix Level 2 book, and in your ICD-10-CM book. Um, it starts out with general a general listing of procedures. And then if you turn the page, more illustrations on page 132. And then starting on page 133 is the table of contents of how the section is actually broken out um, as pictured on the slide. So you have the head, codes for the head, um, start on page 150. Codes for the neck, start on page 155. Codes for the back are on page 156. So this is this could be helpful to you. Um, obviously, you're always going to start with the index first, but if you just need to go to a particular section of codes, you can use this as well. Um, so again, you can see it's formatted by site. So if you look at how the table of contents looks, and then you go to page um, 140, that starts with the, the um, anatomic site of general. Um, and then under general, you have procedures that would fall incision, um, excision, introduction or removal, wound exploration. So that is exactly how the entire chapter is going to look. And actually, that is how the entire CPT book is going to look from here on out, um, where it starts with the head. You know, you have head as the header on page 150, and then it has incision, excision, manipulation, head prosthesis, introduction or removal, repair, revision, or reconstruction. If you start on page 155, it has the neck, and for the neck, incision, excision. So it'll have the body part or area, and then the procedure is specific to that area. And that's the same common trend that you're gonna see um, throughout the book. So the general subheadings, typically that is gonna to refer to different anatomic sites, but the other subheadings, they're gonna be divided by the site, the procedure type, the condition and description. And that's how you're gonna see these incision, excision, introduction or removal, repair, revision, et cetera. Types of fracture treatment. Um, closed means that the fracture is not surgically exposed. Um, and that can be done with three methods through uh, without manipulation, with man manipulation or with or without traction. So think about if somebody has a broken bone and they just need to snap it back in place, right? Or if it's broken, but they're going to leave it as is and they're just going to splint um, or what have you. 
types of fracture treatment. Um, again, an open fracture is when the bone is exposed. Um, and that could be surgically in order for them to um, apply internal fixation, pins, screws, etc. Percutaneous skeletal fixation is, um, this is not open or closed, but pins are placed across the fracture site. So like when people have that uh, metal object thingy, you know, attached to like the outside of their arm or or it could be um, a skeletal fixation. It could be like a skull halo as well that um, put in, inserted by pins. Um, traction is the application of pulling force to hold a bone in alignment. Um, skeletal refers to the use of internal devices and um, skin. Skin can be strapped or taped in order to achieve um, bone alignment or placement like like uh, when you break your toes and they'll usually wrap it or buddy tape it to another toe to keep it lined up in place. Um, general is not specified to any anatomic site. And um, one thing is the incision of soft tissue abscess. If you see that soft tissue abscess, then that typically is going to mean it's associated with deep tissue. So you would select the code that references deep. Um, that is because we're in the muscles. You have to think about the system that we're in first, musculoskeletal. And muscles are deeper than your integumentary system, subcutaneous. You got to go deeper. So um, the closer you get to the bone, the deeper it is going to be. Wound exploration is something that they do typically, you know, if someone comes in like trauma, maybe a car accident, uh, mo uh, motor vehicle, I'm sorry, or a gunshot wound. So they'll do um, exploration, which would include a debridement, cleaning out any debris like glass, removal of foreign bodies like glass, um, ligation, coagulation, minor blood vessels. So basically just taking that area and treating it until they see healthy blood or healthy skin tissue. Um, excision could refer to um, biopsy of muscle or bone, and it typically is going to include local anesthesia, incision, removal of tissue. So remember the definition of excision and also the suffixes of excision um, or keywords. Introduction means that they are putting something into, they're inserting something into the body, a needle, a graph, uh, pins or wires, injecting something, removing something, aspiration. All of those refer to as um, introduction. Graphs can be various types of tissue. It could be the patient's own tissue. It could be um, uh, manufactured tissue. Um, bone grafts, free osteocutaneous flaps. We talked about flaps um, last time. Um, anatomical subheadings are going to be based on your anatomic site. And so they're then divided based on the procedure. So again, your incision, excision. So remember to refer to your CPT book page. I think it was page. Roman numeral 20 to help you with your keywords for um, surgical procedures. Um, surgeries for the spine. So the spine, just because of how it is um, sectioned in the book, you're going to see, you have to understand the anatomy of the spine first. So cervical spine, that's your neck, that's C1 to C7. So each space in that neck and a good illustration, let me see, would be um, really great illustration. It will probably be more in the nervous system. But um, if you look at the illustration on page 132, you can see the L, your lumbar spine, which is the lower back. But, you know, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. So this is a great point. This is showing you the bone. It's not showing you the, the internal space in between um, the intervertebral disc because that is neurology. 
and that is going to be another chapter. So again, all of our organs run together. Also, if you look on page 132, you can see the spine and, and those lines in the spine where it talked about sutures of the spine because those bones are making a joint. It's just a joint that doesn't move um, once they're connected. Um, spinal instrumentation. So if they have to insert some type of instrument or device, a plate, a screw, a rod, um, is going to either be segmental or non-segmental. So segmental means that it is attachment at each end of repair and at least one other attachment in the area being repaired. And non-segmental means attachment of the device at each end of the area being repaired. Um, a application of cast and strappings. Use these codes when the physician actually applies an initial cast strapping splint prior to the definitive treatment by another doctor. Uh, when they apply a subsequent cast after or when they treat a sprain and don't expect to provide other types of treatment. So like if the patient came in the emergency room, you don't, don't usually go back to the ER. Um, for treatment after that, they tell you to go to your primary care or they send you to orthopedics for treatment. Um, endoscopy and arthroscopy are also uh, surgical approaches and how they would perform surgical procedures on the musculoskeletal joints. Um, they can use, anytime you see scopy at the end, that means they had to use a camera, right? Um, like a telescope, think scope. Um, so these are typically going to be diagnostic, meaning patient complains of pain or swelling. Let's put a camera in there and see what it looks like. An arthroscope. So if it's going in the joint, it's, it's an arthro because arthro means joint. Um, it's an arthroscopy. If a patient has multiple procedures and they do, um, an arthroscopy, then chances are the arthroscopy was diagnostic, meaning they only put the camera in to look at it before the surgery to make sure that they had the right area targeted. And then they put it in after the surgery to make sure that they actually completed the, the repair correctly. Um, so they would call that diagnostic. So we wouldn't code it separately then, only if, if that was the only procedure performed. Um, Higgs Peaks Level 2 book, so supplies. Remember Higgs Peaks Level 2 is the book that we use for supplies and equipment. So that would be important in the musculoskeletal chapter because of fractures, sprains, and things like that that would prevent someone from walking. So for your crutches, canes, walkers, wheelchairs, etc., all of that would be coded slash build from the Higgs Peaks Level 2 codes. Also remember with this section, modifiers are going to be extremely important. So your 50 modifier would represent, you know, right or left, um, or right and left, sorry, if it, if it was a bilateral procedure, your um, RT would be for right side only, LT left side only. And then there's additional Higgs Peaks modifiers that would be appropriate based on the documentation. There are specific modifiers for your toes and your fingers, as you can see here. So the FA through F9 for your finger <laughs> and the TA through T9 is for your toes. So that in essence completes the actual lecture, but I do want to also go over um, A few exercises. So, um, you know, you have your section one, section review A.1, section review A.2. Um, with A.2 particularly, and I know that the answers as well as the rationale is here, but intentionally, um, because I want you to understand that, you know, with these um, fracture um, diagnosis codes, if they say that it requires a seventh character, your seventh character is going to come from the tabular list. So you're always going to have to verify your code in the tabular list 
to determine what your seventh character is going to be. So the A seventh character means that this is the initial treatment that the patient is seeking for this condition. Um, the D is going to mean subsequent, meaning the patient has been treated for this condition um, and they subsequently are coming back for care due to another condition um, or another sign or symptom during that period. And then the S, the sequela, the sequel, means that the patient was completely healed and now they have something new going on. So um, the mod, I'm sorry, the seventh character definitions are in the tabular list. Um, just kind of familiarize yourself with them and, you know, you can reference back to this presentation to kind of use that as a guide. Um, but one thing I wanted to also let you just see so that you can, again, kind of help yourself understand why this, the answers are what they are, um, is the section review for 8.3. And once you really get the hang of this, going forward is not going to be an issue for you because all our chapters are going to be designed the same way. So you'll frequently see, you know, procedures for um, arthroscopy, endoscopy, colonoscopy, um, arth I said arthroscopy, um, cystoscopy would be, you know, the bladder, putting a, a scope inside the bladder. So you will become, you know, very familiar with these over time. Um, even, you know, your ectomies, hysterectomy, um, colectomy, cholecystectomy, mastectomy. You'll become um, gastrectomy, which is the gastric, you know, bypass. So you will become familiar with these terms over time. Um, so I wanted you to be able to see, you know, the answers here along with the rationale so that this could be, you know, with, a, with the goal of this being helpful to you and also with you being able to kind of fully understand how to utilize your modifiers when needed. So in the skin section, we, we had some main modifiers that we used, which were, you know, 59, 51. Um, mainly, but for this section, likely the more, uh, the most modifier usage you're going to see is LT, RT, or 50, um, along with the modifiers for the fingers and toes. Um, another thing, we're also going to look at some of the practical application exercises in our live class. So, Again, with the effort of making sure that you kind of understand how to point out keywords, what what things you need to look for um, in your lecture, your diagnosis coding, um, that X, meaning the X is a placeholder. So in the event, and this is probably something we got, you know, weeks ago uh, or we went over weeks ago, but now practical application means you were introduced to the information at some point. Now you have to use it and apply it to what you've learned. Um, so we'll go over, you know, some of these cases from the practical application as well. Um, that was case one that we previously looked at. There's case two, which is a humerus fracture and they want us to code the um, open treatment of the less proximal humerus. So it's showing you here, you know, what are some of the key words that you should be looking at? What are the key words you should be looking at? Um, so your initially you have your post-operative diagnosis, which is what we code from for our primary diagnosis. Um, the operative procedure is your starting point to kind of know where in the CPT index you're going to go. So you're going to go open treatment. Actually, you can go to fracture. You can go to fracture and I'm going to show you that. Um, it shows you what devices were implanted. It shows you that the um, procedure was, you know, the initial data they have to put in there about making sure the patient is stable and that they confirmed which area needs to have the procedure performed. The fragments were immobilized and the humeral head fragments were removed. So it's telling you what they did initially to go in and start treatment of the fracture. 
Um, once this was done, the stem was prepared up to size 10. The trial reduction was carried out with the DuPont trial stem and implant. So you can see that based on these words, open treatment means that they had to cut the patient open. They had to implant a device, which they also have here. So that's internal fixation. So if you go in, that there was a bone graft performed. So if you go down to the answer here and it asks what was performed, then we have, um, we can go to fracture. So for your diagnosis, as well as your procedure, because remember in the CPT book, you can search by procedure as well. So we can go to fracture. The specific bone was the humerus. The fracture treatment method was open and it gives you the codes 23615 and 16. But once you read the code description um, in 23616, it shows that a, prost a prosthesis was inserted, um, which is gonna be reported with this code 23616. And because it was the left humerus, you apply your modifier LT. And there's your diagnosis code and its reference. As you can see, it has the A seventh character for initial treatment. So hopefully this has helped and we will continue this discussion in your lecture for this evening. Thank you all so much for your time. Bye-bye.